Please turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Genesis chapter 24. Today when I read, I'm going to be reading from the New International Version, and we're continuing our series called Story Time. In this series, we're looking at some well-known stories from the Bible, and we're talking about what those stories mean for us. So far, we've talked about Adam and Eve. We've talked about Noah and the ark. We've talked about how God blessed Abraham and Sarah with a child in their old age who they named Isaac. And then last week, we talked about how many years later, the Lord tested Abraham's faith by asking him to sacrifice Isaac. And thankfully, even though Abraham did follow the Lord's orders, even though he was obedient, the Lord stopped him before he took Isaac's life and uh, provided a ram for the offering instead. So today we're going to move forward to one of the next major events in Isaac's life. Now, I mentioned many churches are going to have a sports-themed message today. There's some kind of game going on or something like that today, but I figured with it being just two days from Valentine's Day that it might be a good day to read a story about love. So today we're going to read the story of how Isaac found his bride. It's a great story. It's one of those stories that when couples are sitting around talking about how they met one another and, and, you know, telling their love story, it's one of those that everyone hears and says, oh, that's so sweet. That's so neat. That's so cool. Now, if you've never heard this story, you are in for a treat today. The story is recorded in Genesis chapter 24. Now, Abraham's wife, Sarah, has died, and Abraham is a very old man. And before he dies, he wants to ensure that he has a wife for his son, Isaac. After all, you can't exactly become a great nation until you get married and start having children, can you? There's a problem, though. You might recall that God had told Abraham many, many years ago to leave his homeland and to go to the land of Canaan, which is where he is, and it's the land that God is eventually going to give his people. In fact, it's the land that we refer to as the promised land. It's the land that God promised Abraham he would give to his offspring. So Abraham and Isaac are living in Canaan, and Abraham wants to ensure that Isaac doesn't marry a Canaanite woman. Now, the Bible doesn't lay out very clearly why Abraham doesn't want Isaac to marry a Canaanite woman, but we can use context clues to figure it out. I think the first reason might be the fact that the Canaanites were cursed. You may recall that when Noah got off of the ark, one of the first things he did was planted a vineyard. And then when that vineyard produced grapes and those grapes produced juice and that juice became fermented and that fermented grape juice became wine, Noah drank it and he ended up getting drunk and getting naked and passing out in his tent. And his son Ham went into the tent, and he saw his father naked. And instead of covering him up and keeping it to himself, he chose to go out and tell everybody about it. So when Noah woke up, he wasn't very happy, and he cursed Ham and his son, whose name was what? Canaan. He cursed the Canaanites and said that they were a cursed people. That may be why that Abraham didn't want his son marrying a Canaanite. Or or, or it could be the fact that they, we know, worshipped idols and false gods, which was an act that was detestable to the Lord. So Abraham didn't want Isaac finding a Canaanite woman, and that makes him decide in verse 2 to tell his most trusted servant to return to his homeland and find a wife for his son Isaac. And Abraham doesn't just want his servant to say that he's going to do it. He wants him to swear an oath to God that he'll go back and he'll get a wife for Isaac. Now, the servant is worried that that even if he goes back and even if he finds a woman who's willing to marry Isaac, who she's never met or even seen, that there's a chance that this woman might not want to actually leave her homeland and come to Canaan. So he asked Abraham, he says, Abraham, listen, 
I'll go back and do this, but if I find your son a wife and she's not willing to come here, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to just take Isaac back there? Well, Abraham knows that the Lord brought him to this place and that the Lord promised him this land, and he promised to give that land to Abraham's offspring. So he tells his servant, no, don't do that. Don't don't ever take Isaac back there. But he says, listen, the Lord's going to work it out, but even if he doesn't, if you go and you find this woman and she's not willing to leave and come here, then you are released from your oath. So with that assurance, the servant swears an oath to God that he will go back to Abraham's homeland and he will find a wife for Isaac. And then he loads up 10 camels worth of gifts and such, and he heads out. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us anything at all about the journey. But depending on which commentary you read, you know that the distance was somewhere between 300 and 600 miles. Now, the difference there depends on where you think that Abraham was and where you think that he came from, but he was somewhere between 300 and 600 miles. So with camels that travel roughly 25 to 30 miles a day, this trip took somewhere between 10 days and one month. And today we're going to pick up the story in verse number 11 of Genesis 24, right after the servant arrives in Abraham's hometown. Now, I want to tell you up front that we're going to read a lot of Scripture today, okay? So so just bear with me. I normally try not to read too much, but but this is a, a good story, and it's a long story, and I want you to get it. So here we go, starting in verse number 11. He had the camels kneel down near the well outside the town. It was toward evening, the time when women go out to draw water. Then he prayed, Lord, God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, and she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one that you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he had finished praying, it says in verse 15, Rebekah came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother, Nahor. The woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever slept with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, please give me a little water from your jar. Verse 18 says, drink, my Lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. And after she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they have had enough to drink. So she quickly emptied the jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water, and drew enough for all his camels. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took out a gold nose ring weighing a becca and two gold bracelets weighing ten shekels. Then he asked her, whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? In verse 24, she answered him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, born to Nahor. And she added, we have plenty of straw and fodder as well as room for you to spend the night. Then the man bowed down and worshiped the Lord. Praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. The young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. As soon as Rebecca finished telling her family about this man, her brother ran out to meet him. He invites Abraham's servant and his men to stay with him. They bring out food for everyone to eat, but the servant refuses to eat until he gets an answer. 
he tells them about Abraham and about Isaac and how Isaac was born to Abraham at an old age. And he, he retells the story of the entire event from the oath to the trip to his prayer to everything that happened at the well. And then he says, so what do you say? Rebecca's family agrees that she will marry Isaac and the servant presents gifts to Rebecca and to her family. And this brings us all the way down to verse 54. And I want us to read just the next few verses together. Starting in verse 54, it says, Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night there. When they got up the next morning, he said, Send me on my way to my master. But her brother and her mother replied, let the young woman remain with us for 10 days or so, then you may go. But he said to them, do not detain me. Now that the Lord has granted me success to my journey, send me on my way so that I may go to my master. Then they said, let's call the young woman and ask her about it. So they called Rebecca and they asked her, will you go with this man? I will go she said. So they sent their sister Rebecca on her way, along with her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men. Rebecca then returned to Canaan with Abraham's servant, where she met Isaac and she became his wife. And they lived happily ever after. Isn't that a cool story? Rebecca becomes the wife of Isaac, and and eventually she'll become the mother of a child that will be named Israel. Rebecca will be the grandmother to the 12 heads of the tribes of Israel. But she wouldn't be if it weren't for this story. If Abraham hadn't sent his servant, or if his servant had chosen not to go, or if, if things had gone differently at the well, uh, if, if her family had said no, or if Rebecca that morning had said no, then she never would have been used by God for this extremely important assignment. Have you ever thought about that? So many things had to line up just right for Rebecca to be able to fulfill her destiny. This morning, I want us to take the next few moments to look specifically at three aspects of Rebecca's nature that allowed her to be used by God. As I read this story, I began to realize that these three characteristics are things that I have seen in the life, life excuse me, of every single person who I've seen who made a big impact for God. These are characteristics that we should all seek to have in our own lives. So today, I want to challenge you to evaluate your life and determine whether or not you have these characteristics that Rebecca had or whether you need to ask God to develop them inside you. The first thing I want you to notice about Rebecca is that she was a hard worker. Church, our introduction to Rebecca is her going and getting water for her family. And I doubt many of you have ever had to tote water But let me tell you something. That's not an easy task. Water is heavy. And it's not easy to carry. It it moves around and it sloshes and, and it gets all over everything. And by the time you get to your destination, you usually have less than what you started with. And here Rebecca is, not whining or complaining, but simply carrying water for her family, carrying water for her home. Well, pastor, that's what she's supposed to do. It's her responsibility. Yeah, you're right. I'm not going to disagree with you there. It is her responsibility. But let me ask you this. How many times have you not done something that was your responsibility? How many times have you seen other people who didn't do something that was their responsibility because it was hard? Just because it was her responsibility doesn't make it any less hard and doesn't mean that she wasn't a hard worker. 
And just in case anyone ever wondered whether Rebecca was a hard worker or not, the Lord decided to include in the Bible what Paul Harvey would call the rest of the story. Because she wasn't just going and getting water for her family. Verse 17 tells us that while she was carrying the jar full of water up the hill, a stranger approaches her, and what does he say? Can I have a drink? She quickly lowers the jar from her shoulder and holds it in her hands and allows him to get a drink. And then she does the strangest thing I can imagine anyone ever doing in this situation. She dumps the rest of that jar of water that she's just carried up the hill into the trough and says, oh, and let me get water for your camels too. Until they've had enough to drink. Church, imagine it's you carrying that jug of water. What are you going to do? I can tell you what a lot of you would be doing. You'd be avoiding eye contact with the thirsty stranger. Just looking the other way. You'd be, you'd be walking a little bit slower letting those other ladies get ahead of you so that hopefully that stranger could get to her first. You certainly wouldn't be saying, sure, have some of this water I just got, and while you're at it, let me get some more for your camels. Your ten camels. It wasn't like it was his one camel. She said, let me get water for your ten camels. And let's not forget that these camels just got to town from a long journey. Now, certainly they had water along the way, especially if it was a month-long journey, because a camel can go about ten days, I think, without water. But it's probably been at least a few days since these camels had any water. And I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but camels are not light drinkers. You ever heard the saying, drinks like a fish? It was created with somebody talking about a camel. A camel will drink generally 20 to 30 gallons of water at one time. And it doesn't take long, usually about 13 minutes. And there were 10 of these suckers. Listen, even if we go on the low side, even if we're really conservative, then Rebecca toted 200 gallons of water up the hill. Probably three gallons at a time. That's roughly the size of most of the jars they've found from that time period. So she made 60 trips or more up and down that hill. Listen, let me tell you, if you think packing toys for the great gift exchange is difficult, man, it doesn't hold a candle to what Rebecca just signed up for. And she did it without even being asked. It's not like the guy said, hey, can you give me and my camel some water? He just said, can I have a drink? And she says, yeah, sure, you can have a drink. Let me me water those camels too. Now, we know for sure that this wasn't a normal thing for a woman to do. How do we know that? Because if it was, it's not the test that Abraham's servant would have used in his prayer. I remember when we were getting ready to plant this church, I was trying to make a decision whether whether it was just my emotions because of the connection I had with the church that closed down or whether the Lord was telling me to do this. So I went up to a prayer garden, and I sat there in my truck, and I said, Lord, if if this is you, if you want me to do this, I want you to let a bird land on that puny little tree that no bird would ever want to land on. And then I said, but I don't want it to just be coincidence, Lord. So if you don't want me to do it, then I want you to let a bird land on that big, beautiful tree that every bird would want to land on. No bird ever landed on either of those trees for about an hour. It was ridiculous. The point is, I didn't choose something that was likely to happen for my test, did I? And this man wouldn't have chose something that was likely to happen for his test. So we know that this wasn't a normal thing. But Rebecca just offered to do it because Rebecca was a hard worker. 
Let me tell you something. If you're ever going to make a difference for the Lord, you need to be a hard worker too. Paul talks about this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. He tells us the church that anyone who's not willing to work shouldn't eat. That's how important it is to be a hard worker. He says if they don't work, don't let them eat. And then he reminds us to never tire of doing good works. First thing I want you to know is Rebecca's a hard worker. The second thing I want you to know is that Rebecca had a generous and hospitable spirit. Now listen, this is illustrated by her actions too, right? She's going out of her way to do this for this man, but, but she didn't just give the man a drink, and she didn't just water his camels. She also said, oh, and you know what? You can come spend the night with us too. Bring your camels, bring your men. You guys come stay with us. Verse 25 says that she tells Abraham's servant, we have plenty of straw and fodder as well as room for you to spend the night. You know, it's interesting to me that Rebecca made this offer without ever talking to her family. Did you notice that? She made this offer before her brother got a chance, before he had even met this man. Can you imagine how things would have went if Rebecca said, oh, yeah, and you can come stay with us too. And her brother said, what did you just say? I'm sorry, what? But I don't think that would ever happen because you'll notice the first thing that her brother did when he heard this story. The Bible says that he hurried, everybody say hurried. He hurried out to meet Abraham's servant. And when he got to him, he said, man, what are you doing still out here? Come on. He said, I've already prepared the house and we've got a place for your camels. Come to the house. Let's go. You're staying with us. And then they get there and he has food brought out for everybody. See, I believe that as is the case much of the time, that these siblings were generous and hospitable because they had been brought up to be generous and hospitable. I believe Rebecca knew when she made that offer that it was no big deal because that's just what they did. They were brought up to provide for the needs of others. They both responded in the same way because they were both trained to do the same thing. And I don't believe that their generosity and hospitality went unnoticed. We know that it pleases the Lord. We know that the Lord loves a cheerful giver, that the Lord loves it when we are generous people. In fact, I happen to believe, now the Bible doesn't say this, but I happen to believe that the reason Rebecca was able to say, listen, we've got plenty of hay. We've got plenty of fodder. We've got plenty of room for you to stay. I think the reason that she was able to say we've got plenty is because they were generous people. It's because they lived their lives as people who share. We know this pleases the Lord In the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, God himself made it clear how he feels about being hospitable and generous. He's talking to the Israelites, and and he tells them that he wants them to feed the hungry, to provide shelter and clothing to those who need it. And then in verses 8 and 9 of Isaiah 58, he says this is what will happen when, when they do. Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. The Lord says, listen, if you're generous, if you're hospitable, if you take care of people, then I'll take care of you. Rebecca was a hard worker and a generous and hospitable person. As Christina comes, I want to tell you the final thing that I want you to know about Rebecca is that she was willing to go. In verse 55, Rebecca's family said, hey, let her stay with us. Let her stay with us for another 10 days or so. How many people know that or so can turn into a real long time? Let us stay with us for another 10 days or so, and then you can go. Now, listen, I don't think they were up to anything nefarious. I think they just didn't want to lose their baby girl. 
They just didn't want to see her go. I get it. Believe me. Because Courtney comes home about once every six to eight to 12 weeks. And every time she comes home for a weekend, I know that on Sunday evening she's going back. And I don't like it. And every time I'll ask her about a hundred times, hey, why don't you just stay for another hour? Why don't, why don't you just, just give us a little more time? Just stay for another hour or so. It's the same thing with Justin and Taylor. They come over for a game night. Man, they live 25 minutes away. I still don't want to see them go. I don't think they were doing anything nefarious. I think they just didn't want to see her go. They just didn't want to say goodbye. I get it. But the servant says, listen, don't make me wait. Don't make me wait. Now that the Lord has has answered my prayer, the Lord has led me to you, that we've made the arrangement, let us go. So they say, well, let's just ask her and see what she wants to do. Honestly, you know what I think? I think they thought she was going to say, let's wait. I really do. I think they thought she was going to be like, you know what? Maybe we just put this off for a little bit. But she didn't. In verse 58, they call her in and they ask her, do you want to stay or do you want to go? And Rebecca simply replies, I will go. When I first read this, I thought, why in the world would she go? Why would she choose to do this? Why would she say, you know what? I'm going to go with this man who I barely know to go marry another man who I've never even met. You know, usually in this day, the women didn't get a choice. But they gave Rebecca a choice. She said, you know what, I'll go. I couldn't figure it out. And then I realized it's the same reason that made her family choose to give her away in marriage. See, the night before at dinner, Abraham's servant had asked for an answer. He said, so what do you say? And we didn't read this, but verses 50 and 51 of Genesis 24 record their response. It says, this is from the Lord. We can say nothing to you one way or the other. Here is Rebecca. Take her and go and let her become the wife of your master's son as the Lord has directed. They said, this is from God. We don't have a choice here. This is what the Lord wants. I believe that's the same reason that Rebecca made the decision she did the next morning. God said, go. And she said, okay. Now I'm going to be honest with you, church. I personally think that's the most important characteristic that Rebecca had. Her willingness to go where the Lord told her to go. And sadly, I think it's also the the one characteristic that many people today don't have. You see, we'll spend hours, days, weeks planning our futures, planning our schedules, planning where we're going to live, where we're going to work, what we're going to do without giving any thought at all to what God wants. And then when God does stick his nose in and ask us to go somewhere or do something, too many times we don't say, I will go, like Rebecca did. Too many times we say, well, Lord, let me just check my planner. Let me just see how that fits into the plans that I've made. See, church, we need to be more like Paul, who the Lord said go, and he said, yeah, I'll go. I will walk the distance of circumventing the earth 22 times. Sure. We need to be more like Philip, who was, man, having a revival. He was loving life. The Lord said go, and he said, all right, I'll go. We need to be more like Isaiah. Isaiah. Who in chapter 6, when the Lord said, Whom will I send? Responded by saying, Here am I. Send me. Rebecca was a hard worker. 
with a generous and hospitable spirit. And most importantly, I believe, she was willing to go. Today, I'm going to ask everyone in the room to bow your head and close your eyes. Today, if you're here and you say, Pastor, you know what? If I'm really honest, I don't like hard work. It's not that I'm lazy, I'd just rather not. Sometimes I don't go and do things. I don't volunteer at outreaches. I don't help with set up or tear down. I don't serve in the church or, or I don't do whatever just because I, I'm, I just don't want to. I just don't like hard work. But I want the Lord to change that inside of me. If that's you, lift up your hand. Who else? If you're here today and you say, you know what, Pastor? I want the Lord to give me a generous and hospitable spirit. I don't want to be greedy and I don't want to be selfish. I want to be someone who wants to help other people to take care of them and to fulfill their needs. If that's you, lift up your hand. Thank you. Who else? Bunch of hands. You put your hands down. If you're here and you say, you know what, Pastor? Sometimes I get caught up in my own plans. So when God asks me to do something that's contrary to those plans, I don't want to do it. I want him to help me be willing to go wherever he calls me. If that's you, lift up your hand. Lord, I'm so thankful for this story. God, I've read it so many times and I've heard it preached many times, but I don't think I've ever looked at it from the viewpoint of Rebecca. I'm thankful that you gave us a window into her life, into her mind and her characteristics, Lord, ultimately into her heart, that you've given us this example of how we can live in such a way that you can use us to do great things. Lord, you see all the hands that were lifted and all of the different responses. Today, Lord, I pray that you'll help us. Help us to be hard workers. Help us to be generous hospitable people. And Lord, help us to be willing to go wherever you tell us to go and to do whatever you tell us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.